Louisa Vala and you are watching Gay House Insights and today you are in for a very special treat. I am joined by Natalie Warner who is the co-founder and creative director of Green Street Juice and former employment lawyer. Natalie, I'm so excited to be here and to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, excited to see you. <laughs> so before we get into your journey and your career, I wanted to begin with how you came to the idea of starting Green Street Juice. Yeah, I love talking about this story. Um, it's very fate driven, so it's not something that I had strategically planned when you was coming. Um, it was inspired by our time living in New York on Green Street in Soho, and we moved there in 2012 had no idea that when we moved into Green Street that it would then inspire this beautiful brand back home in Melbourne like two years later. Um, but when we moved to New York, I did my yoga teacher training. I also did some integrative nutrition studies and the health and wellness scene in New York was really cutting edge and cold pressed organic juicing became a part of our life there. Um, we moved home and it was very much a missing element in our life back in Melbourne and so we decided to bottle our experience in New York and bring it home to Melbourne with us. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's such a good, good story and so very um, inspiring because it was an idea that you never had and it's come just because of moving to New York. That's right, yeah, it wasn't on the horizon. So I love telling it too, because it, you never know what's around the corner for you if you just stay open. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> you moved to New York because of your partner's work, is that yes. correct? Yeah. So you left everything back home in Melbourne behind, so your family, friends, work colleagues. Yeah. How did you feel? Were you excited, nervous, scared? Tell me. Uh, it's a funny one because the opportunity that came up for my husband, um, Steve, it was never an opportunity we were going to say no to. It was really exciting. And just the opportunity to live in New York in and of itself was amazing, but it was a great career opportunity for Steve. For me though, I had very mixed emotions in the lead up to actually packing up and moving. Um, I was working in-house at a job that I loved um, for a major Australian retailer. My boss was incredible, the team was wonderful, and I'd worked so hard in my career to get to that point. Um, so it was very much a roller coaster of emotion for me, really excited by what might come but also um, very emotional about sort of stepping away from my security blanket and what I knew here in Melbourne. <laughs> so you got to New York, mm -hmm. your partner had something to go to. What did you get up to? What did you do? Yeah, well, this is where our life started to completely transform before our eyes. And we didn't realize that a move to New York would actually revolutionize our health and wellness and then inspire a whole different way of living. So the reason my life took this path is when we first got to New York, there was a period of three months where I couldn't work because I was waiting for my work visa to come through. And in that three months is when I decided to do my yoga teacher training. And then from there, I was more curious about learning more about health and wellness. And I did an integrative nutrition program that then led me to study at an institute in San Diego that specifically works with organic um, you know, juices and organic um, plant-based meals um, to heal the body. And so my life just very naturally took this turn. And then it was when I finished my yoga teacher training, actually, um, my work permit came through and I thought, if I don't take the opportunity to just give teaching yoga a go and explore that, I probably won't forgive myself. So why don't I just use this time to try something new? And it just unfolded from there. Take me back to the start of your professional career because you started out as a law clerk and then you moved your way up into employment law. Why did you get into law to begin with? Well, it's really funny um, that as well, because it was never um, something that was very clear in my career path either. Growing up, I was hugely interested in science. And in fact, I had aspirations to become a vet. Um, I had a big you know, love and still do of uh, you know, animals and caring and nurturing. And so I was fixed on becoming a vet. So when I left school, my first year of university was actually medical science. Um, but in that first year, the reality of what that was, um, you know, 
the lab work in particular and actually coming close to the reality of playing with body parts and getting right into the bio biology, I realised that it probably wasn't what I expected and wasn't for me. The thing is that when I studied, I did a heavy science-based curriculum, but I did do legal studies in year 12. And so when I worked out that medical science or you know the vet path wasn't for me, I thought, well, I enjoyed legal studies. I did really well in it. I'll cross over and do that as a really good solid foundation for what might come next. You specialised in employment law. What was the attraction to employment law? It was that developed over time as well. So when I graduated from university, I did um, a finance law degree. Um, and where I lived, I actually went into the BHP Billiton Group Graduate Program and my specialisation there was in the Human Resources Employment Law stream. So um, I sort of went down that path from there on, but I loved it. Um, kind of had that element of, you know, looking after employment conditions um, and still had a really big people focused. It was really dynamic, you know, different things come up all the time when you're dealing with people, their employment and emotions. So um, my specialisation really started after graduating. And you moved from private practice to in-house. Mm. What attracted you to in-house um, and how was the day-to-day -day experience different to private practice? Very different. Um, I definitely, um, you know, I loved both and there's pros and cons to both, but um, I think I preferred working in-house. More so because from a private practice perspective, you still very much uh, are an advisor and an external advisor. Um, being in-house means that you're a part of the team. You get to have a look at the impact of your decision across the business, um, which again brings in a whole lot of other considerations other than the pure legal um, application. So, And days were very different too because in-house you are part of a team. Your clients are, um, you know, in different business um, units, um, you know, in the same working area. So they'll knock on the door and there might be an urgent issue that you need to deal with there and then. You're a little bit more protected in private practice, I feel, and there might be some additional layers in private practice between you and, and the client. So I feel like more hands-on in-house. <laughs> As you would have experienced personally, Law and the corporate world, world can be quite demanding on, on anyone. What's your advice um, for keeping those demands of clients, partners, um, colleagues under control? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely a challenging one. The key piece of advice I'd have around um, work demands and finding some balance in there is, I love this concept um, called tilting. So it's not so much about thinking I need perfect balance in every area of my life, you know, work, um, family life, preparing meals, um, movement and exercise, being a good friend, being a good daughter, you know, there's many different demands and recognising that it's probably unrealistic to be equally balanced across those demands all of the time. So this concept of putting or tilting your attention into those areas where it's needed most at that time and being flexible and understanding of that. So for example, if there are big projects going on at work and you're going to have to dedicate more time to that, recognise that and prepare for that. So, you know, maybe it'll be like getting um, organised with, you know, food or good nutrient dense juices or being prepared um, and knowing that you're not going to be a perfect food prep person and then work on your um, projects at the same time. So um, being open and flexible to tilting in and out of those areas of your life where the demands needed most. And I think that what comes with that is when you have to look at it more closely is when you find you're tilting in an area most of the time for a long period of time, then that's clearly out of balance. And so, you know, if you're always focusing at work and you're feeling like unbalanced in other areas of your life, then you have to ask yourself the question, why is this happening? Um, do I need to delegate better? Do we need more resources? Um, who can I speak to about this? Um, so being mindful if you're tilting too much in one area consistently, but otherwise um, being flexible and tilting into the areas where it's needed at the time. I like the concept of tilting and allocating the resources to where the demand needs it most. It's really good and we often forget that, okay, I'm gonna be a bad daughter this month because I've got to really focus on 
this project or assignment at work. So yeah. I like the concept of tilting, it's really good. Oh, thank you. I, when I read about it, it's not my concept, I read about it along the way and I, I quite liked it too of being or recognising that perfect harmony and balance at all of the time across all of those areas is probably unrealistic and yeah, tilting in and out as required. <laughs> so you touched on something just before um, about work-life balance. Yeah. What's your view on, on this? Oh, it's such a tricky one. Firstly, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves thinking that we have to achieve a perfect work-life balance and it's a bit like the tilting I just spoke about in realising that you actually probably can't have everything in balance all of the time but with work-life balance um, for me and you know working for myself it's very much an integration um, and I heard this thing about um, work and play balance as opposed to work and life because work is still life and if you're doing something that you're passionate about and is fulfilling you you're putting a lot of energy out there into your work so it's life as well but maybe work play and consider it all as life um, but yeah I think integration is the key there so recognizing that um, you can interplay and have creep in the both um, and it's a bit like the tilting if you um, understand that it's never going to be a perfect balance but you find that your most of your time is being spent in one area then maybe it's like, hey, let's let have a look at this because overall things aren't balanced, but I don't think it needs to be this sort of clear division, if that makes sense. Um, and maybe I think another thing I'll just add there is um, integrating practices that inspire you into your work or your workspace so it doesn't feel like this rigid divide. For example, it's easy for me to do it because I work for myself and you know I love the energy of my space. So in the Green Street offices we have crystals, we have the, the music that we like, we have plants, but if you're working in a legal office or an environment, like bring in a plant on your desk or if you burn a certain essential oil that you quite like and um, have some experiences in and around your work day to make you feel like more fulfilled and not so rigid in between this is play and this is work or, or life and work. <laughs> love it. I, I love the whole concept and I love work play. Work play and maybe integration and of integration, both. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. And, and not being so strict about balance. Yeah, um, yeah healthy. <laughs> Do you ever look back and think, where would I be now if I didn't move to New York? It's hard for me to think about where I would be. I'm really, really grateful for that time in my life because it gave me time off that I can't imagine I would have taken otherwise. Um, to do the yoga teacher training program that I did, um, it was a whole um, full-time month dedicated to that program. And I can't imagine having taken you know, a full month off work to do something like that. So I'm super grateful for that break um, that appeared in my life, which I say was fate driven and steered me on in the path that I am on now. I have no idea what my life would look like um, if I hadn't gone to New York. I was very set on a particular career path and I was doing really well in my job and in the industry. Um, and I thought I had it all worked out, but life happened and took me in a very different direction. So I don't know what it would look like. <laughs> um, but I think when I reflect on that, um, and it's something we spoke about a little bit earlier, having the opportunity to create some space in your life, it doesn't have to be four weeks off, but giving yourself those, that mindful break or time in your life so you are tuned in or tapped into what excites you, what are you passionate about, and things might naturally develop for you down you know, a path or a course if you give yourself the space. Yeah. It's amazing. You just sometimes don't know where life will, will take you. Yeah. And for you, you've, you've ended up with Green Street Jew Food, which is incredible. So. I wouldn't have known in a million years. And the Green Street journey was incredibly quick. Like, we moved onto Green Street in New York in 2012. And I was, I had all expectations of going to New York, you know, riding out my three months off and then getting a legal job in New York um, that 
didn't pan out because um, I didn't you know even end up looking for one um, but so that was 2012 by early 2014 Green Street Juice the brand was a reality so life changed incredibly quickly oh, that is that is very quick yeah <laughs> So I want to shift us into the wellness space now. You have been exposed to some brilliant minds back in New York. Yeah. What's some advice you would give someone to keep, maintain high levels of performance throughout the day and to also keep in control of their emotions? Oh, I love this stuff because um, obviously I'm very, very passionate about it um, and I've had the opportunity to see some really great people in action. For me, the advice would be, um, it really is the simple things that do make all the difference. Um, and it's the things that are easy to do that are easy not to do. So identifying those things and committing to doing them. And some examples like I'll share with you, and they're, they're really simple, um, is um, for me, it's a meditation practice. So it's 20 minutes twice a day in the morning um, and in the afternoon. Um, that's a game changer for me in terms of mental performance and giving your body the replenishment that it needs and your mind the space that it needs. Things like having a, a clear sort of schedule for your day, um, whether it goes that way or not, having some flexibility there, but having some structure in your day so that you know, um, you know when it is you're gonna have a nutritious meal. Um, staying hydrated. So most people who work in an office and most of us in general are really dehydrated and I talk about this a lot. Um, and dehydration affects mental performance, it affects emotions, um, how happy or unhappy you are. Um, so being really clever and smart about pure hydration. Um, and then fresh air and sunlight. So just like a plant needs water and fresh air and light, it's the same thing. If you see a plant that's been underwatered and isn't getting enough light, it looks really worn out and fatigued and, and not vibrant and vital. Um, it's, it's the same with us. So really, really simple tools like um, fresh, clean water, fresh air. Even if you think you're in the middle of a task and um, pushing through is going to be the best thing, you'll find that if you take a break, nourish yourself well, even if it's five minutes of fresh air, you'll come back and be much, much more effective. So work out those simple things that are easy to do and actually do them. And moving on, I want to shift us into more about Green Street Juice. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about it, the ingredients you use, how the juices are made. And I know you do a lot of detox programs, so tell us a little bit more about that and how that actually can benefit someone. Okay, great. Again, love this topic. <laughs> so Green Street Juice is um, unique, or what we think is so special about it, is it's a 100% organic product. Um, the juice is extracted through a process called cold pressed. Um, and what that is, is it's maximizing the nutrition that you get um, out of the organic produce that goes in. So what you're left with is the most nutrient dense juice that's available. And it's organic because juice in its form, its pure form, is actually um, what we call bioavailable or taken up by the body really, really easy. So it's like liquid vitamins, vitamins and nutrients that go straight into the bloodstream. We think it's counterproductive to actually use conventional produce, which is laden with chemicals, into a high performance product that the body's going to take up into the bloodstream and put to good use at the cellular level. So we use organic products, we use glass packaging, so that's a, a clean, chemical-free um, package. Um, and essentially what, what you are, um, what you end up with is a really nutrient-dense liquid um, powerhouse of vitamins and minerals. So for me, one of my secrets in terms of keeping my performance up during the day is infusing my day with a really nutrient-dense um, juice or more, more than one. Um, there's been a study recently by the CSIRO that um, four out of five Australia, adult Australians don't get their adequate um, daily serve of fruit and veggies. Um, and for example, a juice is a really beautiful way to get that and well exceed it. Um, so it's just all about getting maximum nutrition in. Now with a cleanse program, um, you can expect to completely thrive off a program. So what a program is, involves is putting solids aside for a particular period of time and consuming only the pure organic 
juices. You get eight a day, and we customize those juices based on um, your level of you know, mental performance, your job, what you're looking to achieve. Um, and then we put a menu together that we think will best serve you. And the, the premise and the theory and science behind juicing is that when you remove the solids from the system and you flood the body at a cellular level with um, power packed vitamins and nutrients, you're giving your body the opportunity to rest and repair um, and really allowing it to let go of a lot of things that aren't properly digested and a lot of things that are hanging around in the system. So most, um, most fatigue, most illnesses and most things that affect our performance actually comes from an, an overload of toxicity and undernourishment and juicing um, directly addresses both of those things, which is why we love it. <laughs> How long would you say someone needs to do a cleanse to get the most out of it? Yeah, so that really varies um, for each individual, but as a starting point, as a minimum, we would recommend three days at least. Um, seven days is optimal. Um, at the three day mark, a beautiful thing happens in the body where the body switches from using sugar as fuel and it taps into stored fat as a resource and that can only happen under certain conditions and by about three days of your cleanse um, is one of those beautiful natural things that happen so your body moves into this process called ketosis and you're actually using up stored fat as fuel um, most of our toxins are stored in our fat cells so you're able to really get rid of a lot of that excess baggage and burden that hangs around um, from th between three and seven days Mm. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's one of the amazing side effects of juice cleansing, um, you know, getting into fat burning mode and, and just using excess stores of fat that might be accumulating over time. And we don't get to those things if, unless we really stop to take care of ourselves. Like I often think it's just like a car, you know, a car needs servicing at every, you know, certain kilometer phases and we don't think about our body in the same way. And most of us with the daily demands on our life aren't always putting the best fuel in. So if we're not stopping and servicing, we are going to get a build up in the system. And, and that leads to, you know, brain fog and fatigue and extra thickness around the midsection where we don't want it. Um, and general dampened enthusiasm for life. So juice cleanse tends to lift a lot of that fog up and you just feel amazing. <laughs> and how often should someone do a cleanse? We would recommend and what we personally do is certainly at least once every quarter which lines up for us with the change of each season. So we would do at least three days at the change of each season. Um, it means that you are adjusting to the different needs of each season. Going into each season, you're really, you know, rehydrating, remineralizing um, the body, but it also means that you're taking those stop points um, or services um, at equal points throughout the year to keep you humming along. <laughs> and if someone did a three-day cleanse, would it increase their performance levels at work, personal life? Definitely, yeah, we love it. And we love working with professionals and seeing the the increase in clarity um, and mental performance that they get and that's one of the key side effects or key benefits of doing a cleanse. One of the wonderful things about tapping into that fat burning mode I spoke about is it actually starts to fuel the brain with fats which are long lasting and is what the brain needs to sustain and enhance performance. So you tap into that zone and the mental clarity that you feel is incredible. Now, on the back of these bottles, you also have these beautiful little mantras, yes. which this one says, I shine bright like a diamond. Tell me a little bit more about the mantras and where they came from. They are, so when um, I designed the products, um, we really infused yoga philosophy and energetics into the product. So while it's got, while each juice, or we call them elixirs, um, has a particular um, physical, functional property that it's addressing based on the ingredients that we use. The ingredients that we select, uh, selected are also consciously selected for the energetic body as well. And tapping into that energetic side is where the mantras come into. So each of the mantras have an energy or a thought or an intention that's actually linked to the function of the juice. So this juice here, which is um, based on immunity and healthy skin, the eye shine bright like a diamond, you know, sort of taps into the more 
energetic intention of, of shining. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's those little subtleties that we love as well and people will notice and, and tap into. And it's, it's again, it's like life. It's those little things that lift performance as those one percenters and it's, it's the mantras as well and the whole energy that's infused into the experience. And before we wrap up, what's one life mantra you would give to a lawyer? Oh, this is so hard. I thought of so many. So I'm very, I'm going to stick with one, but I want to just sprinkle quickly a few because I've learned, I've learned so much since um, running, you know, um, uh, my own or you know my own business with my husband, um, and you know I've learned things about. Um, you know, not knowing that things don't have to be perfect to execute because there's a lot of perfectionism that runs through you um, as a lawyer. So, you know, um, learning that perfectionism is often a mask or a fear of some description and getting to the bottom of that. Um, I've also learned a lot about choosing or following passion or what you call love over fear and making decisions that come from a place that will really feel you, um, you know, feel a passion inside of you as opposed to making decisions based on fear about what might someone think or what if I wore this to work, what would my senior partner think or what if I wrote this email. So sort of choosing love over fear. But in terms of the legal profession and giving you um, a piece of life advice that I would um, you know, give specifically, um, the phrase, it takes a village, came to mind specifically. And it's because I sort of have these memories of working as a lawyer and being really focused in my own area and silo and not tapping into the power of having a really supportive community around you. So opening yourself up to a like-minded, supportive community um, and tapping into that network whenever you need to. Um, since um, founding Green Street, a lot of the work that we do is collaborating with other brands or tapping into a community of really like-minded people and you achieve so much, but it also is a, another way to really sustain and fuel you. So from a performance perspective, as well as the food that we put into our body, the beautiful juices that we drink, the, the fresh air and the sunshine, another key element um, to support a healthy human is meaningful connection and really healthy relationships. So remember that you don't have to do it alone and that it takes a village to create you know, magic and create really big work. So that's my number one, even though I sprinkled a few other things in there. <laughs> Natalie, this was amazing. Thank you so much. You're such a beautiful soul and you just thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I hope you find it interesting. <laughs> thank you. Now, Natalie and I would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight you're taking away from today's conversation? Comment and share below because I know others will benefit from what you have to say. If you like this episode, I'd be ever so grateful if you subscribe to our channels and share this video with your friends. And thank you so much for watching another episode and I'll catch you next time on Gatehouse Insights.